Hey, welcome back. In this part of the series, we are going to take a deep dive into the world of object-oriented programming, aka OOP. So, what exactly is object-oriented programming? OOP is basically built on the idea of splitting an application into separate entities. It's pretty much similar to the concept of functions, but in a larger scale. That being said, each one of those entities have their own properties, fields, and methods. They're essentially a mixture of primitive types, functions, and or other entities. Now, one of the most important pillars of object-oriented programming, if not the most important one, is classes. You can think of a class as a blueprint of an object because it determines every property and function that belongs to that object. Here's an example. Suppose you have a business that requires your customers to fill a form for you. Furthermore, each one of those forms has the exact same fields for every one of your clients. So instead of creating a new form for each client, you would probably save the form in a file and print a copy every time you are about to make a deal with a new client. That original form saved in a file is the class in OOP, while each filled form by a client is an object, or it can also be referred to as an instance of that class. JavaScript is not an actual object-oriented programming language, even though its creator was inspired by Java to build it. So, although it was possible to imitate the concept of OOP to a certain extent in JavaScript, it still added a layer of complexity and inconsistency to the code, and that's where ES6 came in. It didn't transform the language to a real object-oriented programming language, but it provided the tools to make it look like one. So, enough talking and let's create our first class. To do that, we need to use the class keyword followed by the name of the class and a couple of curly braces. Now, to make an instance from this class, we need to create a variable and then assign it with the instance using the keyword new, followed by the name of the class and a couple of parentheses. So, as you can see, we've just created our first object from the class programmer, yet every new instance we will create will be empty same as the one we've just created because we didn't set any value to it, obviously. So, to fill the p1 object with values, say the first and last names, for example, we need to pass them between the parentheses. Although we did set the values of our object properties, the console still shows p1 as an empty object, and if you think about it, we set the values of the properties, yet we didn't mention the properties keys. So, to do that, we need to add a method to the class, which has a special name, which is constructor. The constructor method takes the same number of parameters as the values we want to pass to our object because in reality when we create an instance, the new keyword actually calls the constructor method of that class, then it creates an object with the properties we set in its body, then it fills those properties with the arguments we pass to it, and finally it returns that filled object. That said, let's create the properties that we want every instance of the class programmer to have. And there we go, now p1 has a property that has first name and last name as keys, which have the values John and Doe as values respectively. Again, let's create a second instance. p2 also has the same properties of p1, but with different values. Now, you might be a bit confused about the use of the keyword this before the keys of the properties. Well, this refers to the current object, so, as I mentioned earlier, the constructor creates a new object every time we call new. So, to tell the engine that we want to add a property to this object, we need to refer to it using this. So, when we called the constructor at the first time, the value of this was actually p1. Then, at the second call, this referred to the p2 object. Now, alongside properties, there are also methods within a class. A method is basically a mere function that we can call from instances of a class. That said, let's create a method and then call it from one of the instances that we have already created. Again, since a method is just a function, it can accept arguments, any number of them. Furthermore, methods have access to the properties of objects that they belong to.
By calling say hello from P1, first name returns the first name of the P1 object, which value is John, because this here refers to the object from which the method has been called. Calling say hello from P2 now, first name returns Michael, which is the value of the first name property within the P2 object. Now, suppose we want to add a third property to our objects, but we still don't know exactly what to use as key for that property. Let's try to add the third value to the instances. Now say we want the name of this third property to be determined by some previous logic. To do that we need to use this followed by a string or a variable containing the string which represents the property name within a couple of brackets. As you see, the third property has the same name as the value of the computed prop variable. Now, every time we change the value of that variable, the property name of the class changes as well. We refer to this type of properties as computed member names because they are not manually set. This approach has another benefit other than just generating the keys dynamically, which is the possibility to create properties in methods identifiers using special characters. For instance, let's try to create a method that has the space character within its identifier. An error message shows up because special characters like space are not allowed. However, with computed property names, we still can do that. So, we can create a variable that contains the name of the method as a string. Or again, we can directly use the string between the brackets. Then, to call that method, we need to use the same notation. So, instead of using the dot followed by the method identifier, we need to use the brackets with the method name as a string in between. As you know, in JavaScript, we can get the value of an object property by using the name of the variable containing the object, follow it by a dot and the key of the property. That said, even if it does work, that is actually a prohibited way of getting the values of an object properties in OOP. So, instead of that, we need to use what is called an accessor method. There are two types of accessor methods which are simple functions, but their main role is to get and update the values of an object properties. So, let's start with the get accessor. To create one, we just need to create a mere method that returns the value of a property. From now on, every time we need to get the value of the first name property, we need to call the get first name method. We can actually keep the same way of getting the property value, however, we need to make a small change on the definition of the accessor method. So, all we need to do here is to add the get keyword before the method identifier. Now, after saving the code, we get an error message which is caused by the 12th line, because this dot first name here is not referring to the property first name, but it's actually calling the accessor method itself since it has the same name. So instead, we can either change the name of the accessor method or the name of the property which is I'm going to do right now. Likewise, to modify the value of an object property, we use to specify the names of the object and the property and assign the value using the equal symbol, but again, that is prohibited in object-oriented programming, so instead, we need to use an accessor method which must take at least one argument. Again, we can use the same old syntax to update the property, even though we are calling a method. To do that, we need to add the set keyword this time before the method identifier. Classes in JavaScript are not a new type, they are actually nothing but normal functions, Therefore, we can apply on classes everything we do on regular functions. For example, we can store a class in a variable, and that's what we call a class expression instead of a class declaration, which we did earlier.
Furthermore, we can also get rid of the identifier after the class keyword, which is similar to the anonymous functions concept, so here we have an anonymous class instead. We can go a step further by making classes as arguments for functions. That being said, let's create a function that accepts a class as a parameter, then returns an instance of it. We have also the ability to set the definition of the class directly as an argument to the function. Now we might want to create a class member that is common for each instance of that class. For example, every programmer has something in common, which is their hatred of bugs. So that being said, we don't need to ask every developer we meet what they hate most in programming. That logic is applicable in OOP. What I'm trying to say is that we don't need to create an instance of the class to know the value of that common property. We can have access to it directly from the class. To apply that concept on our class, we need to create a property, but this time we need to do it outside the constructor since we are not going to access it from an instance. Then we need to use the static keyword. We can do the exact same thing with methods, thus we can create static methods that are accessible directly from the class instead of instances from that class. As you know, there are two types of programmers, front-end and back-end programmers. That said, we can add a property to our class that tells what is the favorite front-end framework for the programmer we create. The problem with that is that such a property could be useful only for a front-end developer instance of that class. Actually, it could be more logical to ask a back-end developer about their favorite database or back-end language instead. So, even if both are programmers, each of them still have their uniqueness. In other words, each of them needs to have a unique property. So, as you might have guessed it, we need to create two different classes. However, repeating the same properties in each class would be a boring and time-consuming task. Not only that, but imagine creating classes that have dozens, maybe even hundreds of properties, that 90% or more of them are common. That would be such a waste of resources, time and effort, and that's where the concept of inheritance comes in. The idea of inheritance is basically creating a parent class that has all the common properties. Then we create children which are simply classes that have their unique properties and inherit the common ones from the parent class. To do that we need to use the class keyword and the class identifier as usual and then we need to type the extends keyword followed by the identifier of the parent class which is a programmer in our case. The rest is pretty much the same. So we need to create the constructor method which now must include the constructor of the parent class using the super method. So we are basically borrowing the constructor method from the parent class to create the common properties and that's pretty much it. And there we go, the P1 object which represents a front-end developer contains a favorite framework property. On the other hand, P2 which is an instance of the backender class contains a favorite database property instead. The same thing goes for methods, so we can call the say hello method from both of the objects and it works because we have it already defined on the parent class.
Again, static properties are not different than regular properties or methods. Thus, they are inherited, which means that we can have access to them from the children classes. Finally, we can stumble upon some cases where we want to have the same method in all of the children classes. However, we want to modify the body of that method in one of those children. That's what is called overriding a method in OOP. To do that, we just simply need to recreate the method in the child class. Now, as you can see, calling the say hello method from P1 returns a different result than calling it from P2 or any other instance of another child class if we do create one. And this is it for this part of the series. So, make sure to subscribe and I will see you in the next one.